thank you, Heavenly Father, this morning as we break the bread of life, as we read your written word, may it become a rema word for each listener this morning. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We can have our seats. Let's appreciate the worship team. I say let us appreciate the worship team. Thank you so much. I greet you in Jesus' name this morning. What an honor, what a privilege to stand here and share God's word. My name is Alice Kimani. I love Jesus because he first loved me. And when he saved me, he has still kept me around. But I'm so glad that I'm, I have a hope of eternal life. But while I wait, I have an assignment. And I know that he's going to help each one of you to do the assignment and do it well. So that when your time come, he will tell you, well done. Welcome, good and faithful servant. Buana asifiwe. Praise, let's agree. When I say praise the Lord, I'll be expecting you to say amen. Let's try. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good students. This is the year of mounting up. And uh, as, we continue, as we continue adapting to the new norm, um, we are still not yet there. We are not where we were, neither are we where we want to go, but we are here. And the Lord has something to tell us. And uh, as we have continued to fellowship together, you will agree with me, there are still many people in our midst you can never account for. How many agree to that? That we are not as many as we used to be then. Yeah. According to you, you think we are okay? You are not surprised there are some people you have not yet seen? Never mind some of you, you have not seen them because you come for this service, you live through this door, and they enter through this one. That's why actually we have not seen them. But the others, they went, and they have not yet come back. And you know, since time, time immemorial, among the many ways God uses to teach, rebuke, correct, and train his people in righteousness is by asking some provocative questions. Remember, God is all-knowing. But yet, he has spoken to you. He can even ask you where you are going. And it becomes an eye-opener, and you ask yourself, exactly where am I going? Exactly what do, am I about to do? That is one of the ways that God has used since them days in returning his people back on course or giving very special instructions. We are aware of the story of Saul. He was on a mission to go and persecute the Christian. And on his way, the Bible says that Jesus asked him in Acts chapter 9, I think verse 4, he, he, Jesus asked him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And let me tell you, after that question was answered, there was a 360 degree turnaround for Paul's life. Many a times when God asks us some of those questions, there are some dramas. Things happen. And God has a sense of humor. Actually, in the book of Exodus, one day when they were about to, the children of Israel were about to cross the Red Sea, he asked Moses, why are you crying? You know something... <laughs> This is found in the book of Exodus, I think 15, 14, or is it 14, 15? And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? And then he was given some instructions. So God has a way of provoking you, asking you a very specific question. And this morning, I have a question I would want to ask ourselves, each one of us. Because whenever that question was asked, our Attitudes and actions changed. Characters were changed and molded. And we are going to find our today's question in the book of Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? In the message version, that same verse says, 
God said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, how should I know? Am I his babysitter? Imagine somebody deciding to ask God like that. See you on Can you imagine if I went home and asked one of my sons or my, my daughters, where is so and so, and they ask me, am I the babysitter? It's rude, eh? We may laugh at Cain. But let me bring it to our attention that sometimes in these times and days, God is speaking to us through his word. He's speaking to us through his servants. He's speaking to us through his prophets. He can, ask, he can speak to you in a dream. And your answer matters. Actually, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you are able to bring out what is in your heart when God asks such a question. We all know why Cain answered that. It is because he was annoyed, he was bitter, he was jealous, because his brother's Abel's sacrifice had been accepted. So he was coming from somewhere. So depending on where you are, your answer will matter. And we can rightfully say that Cain was rude to God. I started by asking, where is your brother? Or where is your sister? That sister whom you have not seen since March 2020. You have never seen them. Some of them you have an idea. Others you have no idea. And it has not bothered you. You have not had any sleepless night because you no longer see him or her. However, maybe your cell leader has kept on asking you, let's find out, let's become one another's keeper, look around, maybe your pastor has sent you to go and find out why, where is so and so. And I'm wondering whether you are better than Cain. I don't know how you, how you did it. You may not have asked that if you are the babysitter or his keeper, but there is that, which, there is that way which where you behaved. Some of us decided to do nothing. And you thought it was okay. By the way, you are not better than Cain who asked God that Emma is the babysitter. And I would want to state here, and I know I'm repeating it in several places, that your leader who sends you to help account for the brethren whom we have no idea where they are, because he is representing God, I pray that you will learn to recognize and respect, submit and support the grace in their lives. They have been given that assignment by God when they delegate it to you. I pray you will be a Christian enough to recognize that they have a responsibility. When, depending on how you answer that question, you will be adorning the gospel to many believers and non-believers. But today, I would want us to read very quickly from the book of Luke chapter 10. There's a story there which Jesus gave. Luke chapter 10, and we are going to read from verse 29 up to 37. In the New Living Translation. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him off his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side. I want you to note there. He crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. You wonder what was on the other side, okay? Then, a despised, I want you to note that, despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with oil, olive oil, and wine and had bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. 
If his bill lands higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I am here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked another question. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. This is a story. The Bible st states very clearly where we started that this man wanted to put Jesus on the spot. And Jesus was very good at that. He made sure you answered your own self. Because by the end of the story, when he was asked the question, who was the neighbor, he already had an answer. In the three char characters we have read about, that is the priest, the rabbi, and the despised Samaritan, we see three types of seeing. And I want you to place yourself in one of these categories. For the priest, we read in verse 31, I think, he saw and went to the other side. The Revite, he saw and went to the other side. The despised Samaritan saw and had compassion. He became the difference. And I want to pose this question to you. I started by asking you, where is your brother? In this church, God created us to depend on him. We are dependent on him. But we interdepend on one another. You are your brother's keeper. I hope so. If God, it was God asking you like... Cain, you would, you would say, yes, you are. And I want to ask you, who are you in your church, in your men's group, in your radius group, cell group, network, family? Are you the problem, the solution, or at least part of the solution? Remember, we started, I started by saying the Lord saved us while found us where we were yet seen us. But when he found us, he made us ambassadors to represent him and represent him well. While we are here adorning the gospel and making him attractive. And how do we make Jesus attractive? We make him attractive by our attitudes and by our actions. We read of a priest, we read of a revite, and you agree with me, they didn't make God attractive. They were too obsessed with their own assignments. Each, the priest looked at the beaten man, the Bible says he was half dead. He was naked and half dead. But they looked to the other side and went on as if nothing has happened. The Revite did the same. He came, he saw, and looked on the other side. The other one came, he looked, he saw, and looked on the other side. And I want to ask you a question. You have looked, you have seen, what have you done? The many things that have happened since 2020, they have become opportunities of ministry one to the other. Ministries to serve. Ministries to be of a give a helping hand. Ministries to show care. Ministries to demonstrate the love that we say that Jesus has loved us on. And in the next few minutes, I want us to pick a few lessons from the story. Lessons we can learn from the Good Samaritan's story. Lesson number one. He was willing to get involved and be inconvenienced. He wanted, he was willing to get involved and be inconvenienced. I want you to mark the word willing. And I want to ask you, are you willing? Are you ready to be inconvenienced? Are you willing to be the difference? Are you willing to be a blessing? Where is your brother? Have you just been looking like the two, the rabbit and the priest? You looked, you saw, and looked on the other side. Until you wonder, don't you, that's assuming people. 
Maybe it comes out better if you thought you are the one. You are dying there and you are looking for any help and you see somebody coming and you think now here comes my help. Somebody comes and looks and looks on the other side and before very long you see the back. I just want you to imagine how you would feel if you are the one or how you have felt when you thought the brethren you do even ask you even an SMS or if you can't afford one bob for an SMS you can walk actually maybe you walk right outside their gate it has not bothered you where is my brother we go to the same church we are in the same cell group we are in the same ladies group. We are in the same men's group. But it has not bothered you. This morning, I have come to provoke you to leave the Christian you say you are. Because God has kept you here because you are supposed to be the salt and the light and be the difference. You know we may quote scripture and recite platitudes on love and God. But unless we are willing to get involved in the lives of others, we are only brewing smoke. The Samaritan woman got involved. Never mind, we don't know his name. They don't have to know your name. They don't have, today we are talking about that person, yet we don't know his name. Let them have a problem describing the actions of love because God is love. This man treated and bandaged the woods. He set the injured man on the donkey. We are talking about involvement. He took him to an inn. He cared for him throughout the night. The Samaritan woman, Samaritan could have said to himself, I give regularly to my church. I have done my part. But he didn't. As the scriptures say, he had compassion and he did something. What have you done with regard to the people who are so much affected and we have continued and we we'll continue talking about the effects. God has an expectation this morning for you, not the church, not the pastor, not your cell leader, but you as a believer. Freely you have received, freely you are expected to give back. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. The Bible says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of household of faith. The needs among us, I want to ask you a question. Do you see them as opportunities to serve or as a burden and a bother? The needs among us. By the way, they are all over. In the many WhatsApp groups you are, there is a link. We are raising funds to support so and so. You just see them, you look, you see, and look on the other side, and you wait. And you are the first one to leave that link. Left, left, left. If you ever entered. Some of us, we just enter for the sake of it. You enter and you do nothing. There is no difference between you, the priest, and the Revite. Who look, they see, and they look on the other side. I am here to provoke you that God has an expectation. When you see it, what do you do? You can be the difference. Lesson number two. This despised Samaritan ignored lazism. This is the season where you forget about the small boundaries you have created for yourself. Such as, that one I don't even know her. I don't, is she from our church? Do you think this Samaritan knew this man? The Bible says he was just, it was just somebody who was walking towards Jerusalem. And he met bandits. He didn't know the person. This despite Samaritan ignored the racism, the hostility that be what was there between him, between the Samaritan, Samaritans and the Jews. He ignored them. He operated above. The love of God is above the race. The love of God is above the tribe. The love of God is above the zone. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. I am, and God expects me to be so. This Samaritan, even though he was considered despised, 
he rose above such shallowness to care for a human being. Did you know that we are all human beings, but not all of us are a human? Have you seen in the news people who behave like they are not human? The things they do to their relatives, the, do, the things they do to their neighbors, you wonder, is this human? He, to be human is to have compassion. They say, blood is thicker than water. But I'm here to say that grace is greater than genetics. Grace is greater than your tribe. Grace works on your inside until your outside is different. Do you know it doesn't bother me when I come to this church? My sister, by the way, you are my neighbor. Where do you come from? Or oh, that is what you ask when you come to church. Before I sit here, where do you come from? It is because grace is above genetics. Grace is beyond and above a tribe. God has an expectation. This Samaritan, despite Samaritan, ignored what was happening in his time. He ignored the racism. Lesson number three. This Samaritan had money. Wa, sina hapo tunapenda. See, we like it. How many of us love money? It feels so nice to have money in your pocket. Even if you go and you don't spend, but it is in your, it's in your pocket. It just feels like... I was looking to see whether Munga is in the house. When he was young, he used to, younger, way younger, he used to, one day, the father came and he was displaying some, some ATM cards. You know the way they, 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 are already, they are expire, and then he wanted to separate them. <laughs> then he picked the expired one and said, Dad, just allow me to put them in my pocket and feel how people feel when they have money until you go to an ATM and all you do is just to insert. It has a, a nice feeling. This Samaritan, despite as was he had money, How do I know he had money? That's why he was able to take the challenge. He picked the man we don't, and take, took him to an inn. I don't, know, I don't want to believe that he had the oil. We are told he bandaged. This morning, if I ask the ladies, because they are the ones with big hard bags, how many of you have got bandages? How many of you have got oils in your bag? Those are not some of the things we carry. But this man had a bandage. Maybe he didn't have, but he had money to buy. So money is good. When you have it, you can buy many things. So you better start praying that you always have money. Because you don't get stuck. You know, some of us want to look so holy. Like Money is not unholy. It is the love of money, which is the root of evil. Money is good. This despised Samaritan had money. This man, we can say from the story, he lived on a budget. He spent less than he made. And he maintained a contingency fund for an unexpected expense. How do I know? He had to, money to spend on a stranger who was half dead on the way. This reminds me of a story of a bishop. And I think he gave it here. Our Bishop Masinde says one time he went to drop a friend after a fellowship in an evening. And when he dropped him, they found some people who told them, we want money. They want to kajak him and the person they were dropping the friends. Thank God he had 2,000 on his shirt pocket. He removed the 2,000 and gave them. The robbers were so happy. They released them and said, thank you very much. Be carrying money. So money is good. It can also save you. I read of another, of another, of another couple. <laughs> Maybe it's one of our, that if year goal, it might come up. Who maintain in their home a blessed envelope for every month. Bishop Bona Sifiwe. And the, and the man was saying, knowing that, that money is there has raised their antennae to the needs allowed them. When you have money, you know you have an extra, you are able to support your brother. 
you are able to support your sister. And when you plant during this season, the time of harvesting, you have no worry. Because you know you have already planted. I want to challenge you. Can you plant when you have no problem? That's where you live. So it is good to have money. Lesson number four. This man had a good name. He had a good name. How do I know he had a good name? The Bible says that he paid some deposit and told the owner of the inn, whatever will be in excess, I'll come back and pay. It looks like he used to, he had frequented there. It was not his first time. I'm imagining if I went to town and carried something in credit and told them I'll come back tomorrow. Do you think they'll trust me? He must have been known and he must have, been, he must have made a good name. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 1, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. And I want to ask you this question. What are you known for? A man, a woman of integrity, reliable, dependable. How do others describe you? You know, sometimes... People describe you and then you wonder, are we talking about the same person? One time we went to visit a family and as they were busy, they put, we talked about a couple who had gotten married, but we had not been able to go and attend their wedding. So our host decided to put on uh, that wedding so that we can be watching. And we were very excited. It was not in Kenya. So we were very excited because we were seeing many brethren we knew who had come for the wedding. But now this was, this is what shocked us. One, one brother came up and then one of us said, oh, this is brother so-and-so. We started describing the man and how he had been a blessing here. Then the couple looked at us like, you want to tell us he's married? Ah, that one, he's married. Because now, we are describing our friend. That brother, we know him. So what are you known for? Do you have a good name? In your plot, in your neighborhood, in your place of work, in your cell, in your readers group, the descriptions we hear, a good name. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, I think verse 1, part A, a good name is precious. A good name is better than precious ointment. Pursue, that should be one of our goals, each one of us, in 2021. To have a good name. Wherever you find yourself, they say, unaweza kukulia jinanzuri. This man could afford to leave a sick person on credit until he comes. He had a good name. I pray that all of us will pursue to have a good name that people can trust us. We can tell he, didn't have, he may not have had so much, but because of his good name, he could still pursue whatever he wanted to fulfill. You don't have to have a lot of money. If you, you accompany the literal with a good name, you are able to do so much. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, to four in the NIV. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Hold there. A proper contradiction. It can only be found in the Bible. Severe trial, the overflowing joy. You are in trial, overflowing joy, the two, they don't look like they can be compatible unless in the Bible. And their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Extreme poverty and generosity. Now you wonder, were they giving poverty or what? I don't know. Higher. Verse 3, they were not giving poverty. For I testify that they gave us as much as they were able, I want you to know that, that God expects you just give as much as you are able, and even beyond their ability, ask me how, I don't know, 
entirely on their own. And verse 4. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. You remember where we had read earlier in the book of Galatians that what is happening, taking it and seizing the opportunity to be a blessing, especially to men and women in the household of faith. You know we are family here and we'll be family there. I guess that's where maybe Paul was emphasizing the family of faith. Extreme poverty and extreme generosity. Yes, you can. I pray you'll not be in that category. Who looks at this one? You look aside and off you are. Where? You are excusing yourself in all of them. Don't be surprised if you never planted when your time comes and you have nothing to reap. That in this family where we are, the, this family of faith, the family of DCAKZ, there are very many opportunities. Currently, how many are like me are wondering, oh God, let us not be found. Give according to your ability. It is not the amount. It is the attitude and the willingness. Giving according to what you are able. Don't allow yourself these opportunities to pass you just like this. Many welfare support links. Many projects in church. For example, in DOI, we have a project on the wheelchair. And we said it is our project for the first quarter of 2021. You see it? You look the other side and you take off. Funerals. You are never available to, to go and pray with the family. You are not available to give. You are not available to call. You are not available to do nothing. What are you expecting? I pray that from today, it can be a provocative question. Next time you see an opportunity, before you look the other side, ask yourself, is there something I can do to this family? In this church, we have this program, Feeding the Hungry. Yes, and no, no amount is too little. You can be a blessing. Even 50 bob, that one is a packet of milk. A family will enjoy a cup of tea because of your generosity out of extreme need because it's not the amount. It is the desire to be the difference. Remember, we rise by raising others. The Samaritan didn't know how long the injured man would be, would be in that hotel. But the text where we read he had been left half dead. And maybe based on that, he would have stayed for a few days, at least not one night. However, at any rate, the well-being of this stranger was more important to the good Samaritan than whatever the cost. This is generosity. And he wouldn't have been able to be generous if he had no money. Therefore, Money is good. You can have money which, which can make you a slave. Allow me to talk about this one. There's some other money which is not good, which I've been hearing of late. Eh? How many have had something called Fuliza? Fuliza? Tara? Okwa Jahazi? Hey, if you're part of that, I'm here to announce from this pulpit. That is a red light. That you are living above your means. You have no budget. Because a budget you plan for what you have, okay? And unfortunately, the Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. I read this quote somewhere. Seeds by themselves are useless unless planted in the proper environment for growth. Are you planting seeds or are you planting needs? If you are living on Fuliza, you are planting needs. I pray and you know when you plant, you multiply the problem. You become a slave to somebody. And I am, I am yet to meet a well they slave. But planting in God's people is a rich ground. You expect a harvest. 
And I want to say this. The central message in this story is that if we are, if we are to be good neighbors, we need to be more like the Samaritan. And I want to pray and declare from this pulpit, may God make you strong financially that you can be a blessing. And cause you to remain strong financially so that you can have means to act on your good intentions. Remember, it will call for you to tell God you need it and be somebody who is teachable. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. In the message version, it says, here is a simple rule of thumb, guide for behavior. Ask yourself, what do you want people to do for you? Then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. Simple rule. In the New Living Translation, it says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Doing to others. You look, you see, but be compassionate. Be the difference. And therefore, I want to ask you this morning. Where is your brother? Where is your sister? Has it bothered you? Are you willing to be involved? Are you willing to work on a good name? Are you willing to be a good money manager and refuse to be a slave? Jesus concluded by saying, telling this man who was testing him, go and do likewise. When we learn this lesson, we and the world around us will be better. This year, KZ will be a better family. If we go and do likewise, if we go and don't close our eyes, the book of James talks about if you find somebody who is feeling cold and you just tell them feel warm, somebody who is hungry, you tell them God bless them. Actually that day the blessing they need is not the verbal one. They need the blessing of a roof of bread. Remember, nobody is too poor to be a blessing because you can actually share that meal you are taking in your home. All of us can be the difference. And finally, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we have discovered love's reality. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. Because of this great love, we should be willing to lay down our lives for one another. Verse 17. Verse 17. Okay. If anyone sees a fellow believer in need and has the means to help him, yet shows no pity and crosses his heart against him, how is it even possible that God's love lives in him? First John chapter 3, 16 and 17. How? Now how? How can you prove to us the way you love Jesus and you can't be the difference? where you live. Shall we pray? The purpose of my sharing this morning is that God can help each one of us to be a difference wherever we find ourselves. That you will have, you will appreciate that the, the, you are giving, you are the giver, you are not the receiving one. I know we like to receive, but you, the touch button for receiving is giving. I want to encourage you that you can be the difference wherever you are. And I know there is room for improvement. I am not complaining. And I have not been sent here by the bishop. Actually, he doesn't know what I was coming to share. I have just come because it is godly to give. We demonstrate how God loves us. We prove to the world when we become one another's keeper. Are you here? And you would want me to pray. Because you want to improve your best. You want to be better. And make Jesus shine adorning the gospel to the glory of his name. Do you want me to pray for you? Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for the hands up. 
We want to thank you because if you didn't want us to be the Christians you are calling us to be, you would have saved us and taken us to yourself. But you have kept us here to be the difference. Give us the desire. Give us the love. Give us the willingness to be the difference wherever there is that need. I pray that none of us will be like the priest. None of us will be like the rabbi. We will look, we will see, and yet do nothing. I want to pray for my brothers and my sisters lifting up their hands that from today they will be the difference wherever you cause them to be. And I know, Lord, when they do this, they'll be causing your grace to shine in darkness. Maybe you are here this morning. We are talking about demonstrating the love of God. You can never give what you don't have. You have never received Jesus Christ as your personal savior. He is the one who gives us the power to will and to do. Are you here this morning? You would want us to pray for you to receive Jesus as your Lord and savior. If you lift up your hand, we are going to pray for you. Are you here? We are not in such a hurry. We would like to pray for you. Are you here? You would want us to pray for you to receive Jesus in your heart. I know the word has been planted. Father, I want to thank you for your word. We read that your word is living. It is powerful. It's alive and powerful. And your people have listened. How I pray for the grace to be doers. If there be one Lord who has listened and they have not yet said yes to your saving grace, I pray, Lord, that you follow up that word to perform it to the glory of your name. We thank you this morning that we have interacted with your word and your word changes our lives and changes our destiny. We honor you, we bless you, for this is our prayer in Jesus' name.